Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us today on this wonderful Saturday evening. My name is Dr. Vineet Nair, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. I'm extremely proud and happy to announce that today is the official launch of Suburban Diagnostics' new Center of Excellence for Hematology. A pioneer in the medical diagnostics arena, Suburban Diagnostics has been a forerunner in world-class diagnostic services since 1994. Our Center of Excellence in Hematology is being launched today with an objective to staying accessible, to impact medical outcomes, and to provide interpretive and other professional support for tests performed through proactive and direct interactions with all referring physicians. Our new center offers a very wide range of more than 200 tests in general hematology, immunohematology, anemia, coagulation disorders, acute leukemia, immunodeficiencies, myelodysplastic syndromes, myeloproliferative neoplasms, chronic lymphoproliferative disorders, and multiple myeloma, to name a few. A panel of experts and best-in-class infrastructure make up one of the best hematological diagnostic facilities available for the medical fraternity in India. Today's webinar on uh, the management of hemoglobinopathies is the first of what will be an ongoing series of academic webinars hosted by the Center of Excellence in Hematology. The theme for today's talk, series of talks is the management of hemoglobinopathies. We have a very star-studded lineup of speakers who will be covering all the major aspects of hemoglobinopathies, ranging from prevalence, diagnosis, to treatment, and the role of public health programs in tracking, uh, tackling hemoglobinopathies. I would like to remind everyone that today's webinar is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To submit a question, simply type the question into the chat box to your right and click send. At the end of the presentation today, we'll be having a Q&A session. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please use the chat box to let us know. With this webinar, we'll also be giving certificates of attendance. All those who complete the webinars and wish to be provided with the certificate must fill a form which we will provide to you at the end of the webinar. Our first speaker for today is Dr. Amar Das Gupta, preeminent hematopathologist and director of medical services at Suburban Diagnostics. Over the four, for past four decades, he's had a storied career in hematopathology at institutions like the PGA, Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in Chandigarh, Tata Memorial in Mumbai, the University of Washington in Seattle, Hammersmith Hospital London, Hinduja Hospital Mumbai, and SRL Diagnostics Mumbai. A fellow of the International Union Against Cancer and of the Indian Society of Hematology and Blood Transfusion, he was responsible for setting up India's first hybridoma laboratory and India's first cytometry laboratory way back in 1995. Without any further ado, let me hand over the reins of this webinar to Dr. Das Gupta. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Vineet, uh, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, uh, it's indeed, as we need to mention, a very proud moment for us at the Suburban Diagnostics to be able to hold this uh, webinar to commemorate uh, the uh, launching of our CO in hematology, which of course is a long cherished dream of the, uh, you know, this organization. Uh, and I would personally like to thank all the speakers uh, for um, uh, sparing time to participate in this uh, webinar, uh, in spite of uh, actually being very busy uh, and today being a, a Saturday, uh, many of uh, our uh, speakers would have would like to close the day, uh, uh, their professional uh, commitments. Uh, and therefore, uh, indeed, it is, uh, it's a privilege and uh, I'm really obliged that all of you could uh, join uh, uh, in this uh, or participate in this uh, webinar. Now, um, the uh, topic that I would cover is uh, actually a very brief topic and uh, may not be that glamorous as uh, the subsequent talks uh, would be. Uh, but I thought I will set the ball rolling and uh, leave the, uh, you know, the dais to the four eminent uh, workers in this field uh, to hear them uh, about the developments in the management of hemoglobinopathies. Uh, which, of course, is an age-old disorder, and uh, um, but there have been a lot of uh, new developments in terms of uh, management of these uh, disorders. So, and uh, uh, I hope uh, all of you will enjoy hearing uh, to hearing these uh, experts and uh, benefit from the insights they are going to share with us. Um, this. Um, uh, cartoon, of course, is very well known to all of you. This is a, 
this is the structure of uh, uh, hemoglobin molecule where as you can see we have uh, two pairs of uh, peptides uh, one pair is uh, which is common to all hemoglobins which we see normally in our uh, body uh, which is which is the alpha uh, peptides or peptide chains or alpha chains and you we always have a non alpha pair of chains which uh, vary depending on the type of hemoglobin involved and this uh, diagram shows uh, the structure of a, a hemoglobin a molecule and uh, here of course uh, we have the uh, non alpha chain as the beta chain and uh, for fetal hemoglobin the non alpha component will be gamma and for hemoglobin a2 it will be delta uh, what is interesting is also uh, that each of these chains uh, have uh, what we call as the heme pocket wherein the heme molecule each chain has one heme molecule which is covalently bound to the uh, peptide uh, links that are present in the uh, uh, polypeptide chain and uh, uh, the, 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 the that's a very uh, kind of a weak uh, connection and therefore there is always a tendency for the heme molecule to drop off the pocket Uh, in conditions of stress particularly oxidative stress and uh, you get precipitation of hemoglobin and uh, that of course is not the subject of discussion today i'm going to just cover the uh, broad uh, background of the entity uh, but it is important to uh, also appreciate that when we talk about hemoglobinopathies we are talking about disorders of the globin chain and not of the heme molecule the heme molecule uh, uh, when it is abnormal or functions abnormally uh, that in uh, that group of disorders is called uh, porphyrias and many of you may be aware of that <clears throat> so just to uh, set the ball rolling and i'm sure dr um, uh, roshan will cover a lot of uh, these things in her presentation but quickly just to recap uh, the abnormalities of uh, globin chains or hemoglobinopathies as i understand and many of uh, you will agree uh, can be divided broadly into inherited and acquired the inherited ones can further be divided into two subtypes quantitative abnormalities and qualitative abnormality quantitative abnormalities are entities where there is reduced production of normal uh, globin and uh, very good examples of course and well known examples are thalassemias alpha beta uh, delta and delta beta and uh, uh, qualitative abnormalities are what we call as variant hemoglobins wherein there is a, a mutation uh, in the uh, in one of the codons one of the bases in each in one of the codons uh, depending on the type of the defect Uh, which leads to a uh, change in the amino acid in that particular position which is coded by that codon in the peptide chain and that results in turn in altered behavior of these uh, globins uh, whether it's hbs or hbd hbe and <clears throat> that is the reason uh, for the pathogenesis that we see in these disorders again i'll not get into the details of that Uh, but uh, this is what uh, also uh, is something we, where we have to pay a lot of attention in terms of uh, whether we are talking about diagnostics or treatment because uh, the burden of these variant hemoglobins or hemoglobin uh, variants is uh, pretty high in our country and so is that of thalassemias uh, of interest is the fact that there are certain conditions and i've listed some of them in which the Uh, production of uh, normal hemoglobins uh, such as hbf or hba2 can be altered and um, th that per se may not be significant it is more of an association but uh, they can interfere with the interpretation of the uh, results of hplc uh, in a case of uh, thalassemia or uh, uh, you know hemoglobin variants and that is where the importance of these entities lies uh, for example increased hemoglobin a2 seen in vitamin b12 deficiency uh, will always raise the question of that being differentiated from a case of uh, beta thalassemia 
And um, many of us have seen that sometimes the value of hemoglobin A2 in vitamin B12 deficiency can be in the range of thalassemic uh, you know, patients. So this is something which we need to keep in mind. And uh, very interestingly, sometimes in MDS and uh, AMLs, particularly myeloid neoplasms, we do get uh, acquired hemoglobin H disease. And that um, is uh, interesting because uh, it is sometimes has to do with mental retardation. And uh, it is as a result of acquired molecular defect, which is associated with these entities. And they being a myeloid stem cell defects, we also have problems in the uh, erythroid lineage, which uh, can be multifaceted. Uh, I have listed some tests here, basically not to, of course, uh, very carefully uh, impinge on uh, Dr. Kola's presentation, but just to, again, as I said, set the ball rolling. And this also uh, is the approach that we follow when we are talking about uh, population surveys or, uh, you know, investigating even patients of uh, thalassemia and uh, variant hemoglobins. Uh, and uh, I have, you might have noticed that I have not listed Electrophoresis because um, alkaline, both alkaline and acid electrophoresis uh, have traditionally been used earlier, but today uh, the role, uh, their role has shrunk to the uh, situation where the HPLC or capillary electrophoresis uh, that uh, we do, uh, if we have any controversy in terms of distinguishing between uh, hemoglobin variants that elute or they uh, migrate to a particular position and uh, they need to be distinguished, uh, then we fall back upon uh, alkaline or acid electrophoresis, uh, the conventional, uh, you know, uh, electrophoresis. Uh, otherwise, uh, HPLC along with CBC uh, gives us most of the information that we require for preliminary diagnosis of uh, hemoglobinopathies, be it thalassemias or, uh, uh, you know, variant hemoglobins. And two uh, simple tests, which uh, are of great significance in uh, population surveys. Uh, and there are multiple, uh, you know, variants of that uh, in terms of POCTs that have come in the market, which can be used uh, in mass screening of patients for, particularly for sickle cell disease. Uh, again, I'm not getting into the details of that. Uh, uh, maybe Dr. Kola will cover that. And this is just, uh, uh, these are the instruments that we use in our lab for uh, you know, characterizing the hemoglobin defect. And um, just to uh, familiarize some of you who may not be uh, you know, aware of the uh, HPLC patterns, uh, what it is in essence gives us is that it gives us the uh, various uh, peaks of the normal as well as abnormal hemoglobins. And we know that a particular abnormal hemoglobin, for example, HBS or HBT, uh, and of course the three normal hemoglobins, where would they come in uh, in the aluate uh, when you uh, uh, look at the optical density of the uh, aluates at different time points? And that gives us a hint and because these are fixed and we call them as windows. And uh, so we know that hemoglobin A will elute in a particular window uh, uh, with a specific retention time. HBS will do that. Why that is important is A, that we can diagnose the variant hemoglobins. We can quantitate these, all the hemoglobins, whether normal or abnormal. And also we can um, identify or at least say that a, a particular peak, uh, if it is abnormal, is not uh, fitting into or sitting in a known uh, window, is likely to be abnormal. And then, of course, we'll have to get into further investigations. And that is where the role of uh, you know, molecular studies comes into play. Uh, so this is a fundamental uh, that we need to all keep in mind. Uh, this is something which I have borrowed from uh, Dr. Roshan's uh, uh, article, which uh, I think she's also going to share. But uh, basically, it's a very beautiful flow chart, which shows you that based on six parameters, that is MCV, MCH, RBC count, RDW, HBA2, and HBF, you will be able to distinguish most of the cases or uh, diagnose most of the cases of uh, thalassemia at least. And uh, depending on the abnormal peaks that you'll see in the, uh, you know, uh, in the HPLC uh, chromatogram, you'll be able to suspect the abnormal hemoglobins and confirm them to the extent possible using sickling 
or solubility test in the case of HBS and others may require uh, uh, additional investigations, as I said, like the molecular studies. Uh, this is uh, the second part of my uh, presentation wherein I'm going to share very quickly the uh, you know, hemoglobinopathy map of India. Uh, this is again borrowed from uh, another article. And uh, here, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the picture depicts the incidence of the three pathogenic hemoglobinopathies, uh, which, are, uh, which are, of course, the commonest in our country. That is uh, beta thalassemia, hemoglobin S, and HBE. And as you can see here on the right upper hand of the map, you have two uh, areas where you have the green uh, shaded uh, you know, uh, box, which is also showing incidence. And that is the incidence of hemoglobin E, which can be very high, as high as 50% in some of the communities that have been screened in the Northeast. So we know that if a patient comes from Northeast in a, uh, you know, in a HPLC, if you are getting a peak in the EA2 region or window, you know in all probability this patient is going to be hemoglobin E disease, uh, either trait or homozygous or E beta thalassemia. And uh, so, and you can see also that uh, the blue uh, boxes are those of uh, hemoglobin, uh, sorry, uh, beta thalassemia, and uh, the yellow one is for um, hemoglobin S. And it's, you can see it's so widely spread. And that actually poses the magnitude or uh, the amount of the problem that we face in our country. And uh, there's a lot of effort that has been put into uh, there's those, but we have really not uh, reached where we should be as a as a country. And this, these things, of course, will be highlighted by Dr. Italia and maybe Roshan uh, and uh, Dr. Agarwal. I need to go a little fast. This is just the uh, distribution in a little more detail uh, derived from what I showed you in the earlier picture. And uh, as you can see, the incidence of certain disorders are common. Uh, in certain ethnic groups, certain communities, some, certain castes in our country, and that is a helpful thing in terms of diagnosis. And uh, and there is, um, of course, what is more imp uh, important is also the fact that uh, many times we come across variants that are not, as I said, fitting into known variants when you are looking at the uh, chromatogram of HPLC. And these are the ones which um, you know also we see uh, not uncommonly. And I'll share some examples of that very quickly towards the end. But uh, that also, uh, again, highlights the point I was making that uh, diagnosis of hemoglobinopathies is a multi-step approach where you start with uh, CBC, you look at the various parameters that I just now referred to, then you look at the HPLC data, and if you are not able to resolve the diagnosis, you need to get on to molecular studies. And this is the approach which universally is now followed and we too do that and we have the provision of doing all these investigations in house uh, just to share uh, the data that we have collected uh, over the last five to six years uh, the first uh, row will show you that uh, of about 34,000 cases that we have investigated in suburban uh, we see that the incidence of beta thalassemia trait which indicates the incidence of thalassemia and the investigated patients is the commonest one. And that across the board has been the experience in most of the labs that uh, uh, you know have investigated patients or have analyzed their data. Uh, I have not quoted the data from SRL where uh, we had done some work, uh, but there also the incidence of uh, um, you know, the trait was and uh, homozygous uh, was high. Uh, this next was uh, commonest uh, even in various other studies is the HBS and this is what you saw in the map and uh, essentially uh, one has to appreciate that this uh, data, the data that I'm sharing from suburban is on referred samples of patients versus the lower three uh, set of data which are predominantly done in the northeast and as you can see here these are uh, uh, you know population data. And there you can see the hemoglobin E level, uh, or rather the percentage of hemoglobin E disease or trait uh, is much higher uh, in these because these are studies which have been done in Northeast. 
And of course, there, as I showed earlier, the incidence of beta thalassemia also is uh, pretty common. And therefore, you see that and a combination of the two is also very common in these uh, populations. This is just to share with you what, uh, you know, one needs to be a little aware of uh, based on the, uh, you know, the experience that one uh, has in the analysis of large population data. And uh, so the take home message as far as geographic and ethnic distribution of hemoglobinopathies in India is concerned, the thalassemias and structural hemoglobin variants are the commonest monogenic disorders globally. Again, these are the points which I have uh, captured from uh, an article which very beautifully summarizes, again, coming out from uh, Dr. Kola's group. Uh, so maybe verbatim, it is uh, the same message that she, uh, they have conveyed and I have just lifted it from there. Basically to convey the, uh, you know, the importance of or awareness that we need to have in these areas. So India has a huge burden of hemoglobinopathy with an estimated mm -hmm. 100,000 patients with a beta thalassemia, with uh, beta thalassemia syndrome and around 150,000 patients of sickle disease. Uh, every year, 10,000 to 15,000 babies with thalassemia major are born. And that tells you the magnitude of the problem and in certain ethnic groups and communities in our country, this is really a major, major problem. Uh, other speakers will highlight this fact. Beta thalassemia is pre uh, prevalent across the country with an average frequency of three to four, which we just now looked at. And it's, as I said, com common in some communities like Sindhis, Punjabis, Gujaratis, Bengalis, and of course, sub communities in uh, various parts of the uh, country. Uh, further, HBS is highly prevalent in the tribal populations of southern, central, and western states, reaching as high as 50% uh, in some of the communities. HBE similarly is common in northeast states and has a carrier frequency of as high as 50% in some areas, as I referred to. It is found in lower frequencies, but it is present in eastern states of West Bengal, Bihar, and Uttar Pradesh. Uh, HBD Punjab, Punjab, as the name indicates, is um, more common amongst uh, the Punjabis. Uh, and HBQ India, interestingly, is common in the Sindhis. And these are the common hemoglobinopathies that we come across in our country. And finally, uh, some rare hemoglobins that we see, and all of us who have worked uh, for some time in these labs, uh, we do come across, uh, you know, the hemoglobins which get eluted, as I mentioned, in uh, standard window, uh, you know, gaps. And uh, these are some of the examples uh, which are not rare, so rare, and we have to be aware of these. And again, as I said, they can be characterized only if you have access to uh, molecular studies. And I'll just quickly show four examples of uh, these. One is hemoglobin hope, which interferes with the HbA1c estimation. Not so uncommon. Uh, one has to be aware of whenever you see values of HbA1c more than what you are accustomed to seeing in diabetics. Uh, you should suspect hemoglobin hope. Uh, this is a case we reported of hemoglobin fontaine blow which comes or eludes in the HBA window with a small peak here. And of course, it was characterized uh, by uh, sequencing. Next is a case of hemoglobin titus will. Again, this uh, hemoglobin eludes in HBS. So when we saw this case, we were wondering, is this an HBS trait? But sickling was negative. And this is not, again, as I'm trying to emphasize, not an uncommon experience. And unless aware, we are aware of that. And very simple tests like sickling and solubility uh, many times help us, uh, you know, give a suggestion of a, a non-sickle hemoglobin eluting in HBS window. And then that needs further characterization as we did. And we characterized this as hemoglobin titles uh, will. And by the way, all these studies we have done in uh, collaboration with uh, in National Institute of Immunohematology have been a great help in resolving many uh, you know, complex uh, problems in hemoglobinopathies across the country. Uh, and of course, uh, Dr. Kola represents uh, that organization. And I also happen to have worked in that place in the beginning of my career. Uh, the next two, hemoglobin Vizu, again, eluting in HBS, and you can see a very sharp peak. Sometimes you may confuse this as uh, hemoglobin Q, but it is not because it is its retention time is different. It is faster than hemoglobin Q in elution. And finally, uh, very interesting two families of hemoglobin O Indonesia in, in the first family, 
it was a combination of hemoglobin S with O Indonesia. And uh, the uh, O Indonesia is a alpha chain variant and uh, therefore the combination of alpha, abnormal alpha chain variant of O Indonesia with abnormal beta chain uh, of the HBS gave rise to these you know, additional peaks. So whenever you see multiple peaks in a uh, hemoglobin, uh, you know, uh, what do you call, uh, chromatogram, you should suspect the possibility of an alpha chain variant. And this is the message that I would like to drive across to our listeners. <clears throat> so I think with that, I'll come to an end of uh, my presentation. And as uh, Vineet mentioned, uh, I'll be very happy to take questions, but at the end of the uh, all the presentations. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Dasgupta. Uh, thank you for the uh, excellent presentation. Our uh, second speaker for today is Dr. Roshan Kola, uh, who retired as the director in charge of ICMR National Institute of Immunohematology, uh, Mumbai, in June of 2015. She served as the head of the Department of Hematogenetics from 80, 1988 to 2015. Her areas of interest include hemoglobinopathies, red cell enzymopathies, uh, and membranopathies, developing screening and molecular programs. She's one of the contributors of the guidelines of hemoglobinopathies in India and of the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and is a member of the expert group for preparing the draft of the national policy on hemoglobinopathies. Over to you, Dr. Kola. Hello. <clears throat> yes, Dr. Yes, Kola, we can hear you. Can you hear me, Denise? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. So a lot of what I'm going to say has already been covered by Dr. Das Gupta, so I'll go very quickly. Can you come to the next slide, please? So we have a very diverse group of hemoglobin disorders in India. As shown earlier, we have the beta thalassemia, sickle cell disease, E disorders, the alpha thalassemias and alpha gene triplications, delta beta, HPFH, Lepore, co-inheritance of different defects and many rare and novel hemoglobin variants, which we have to diagnose. Next. Next. Uh, OK, so there are a total of over 500 mutations. Documented in the HPVAR database, and these affect any of the globin genes. There could be a few fusion hemoglobins, few hemoglobins which alter oxygen affinity. There are some unstable hemoglobins as well as MEP hemoglobins. So we have to be able to diagnose most of these. Next slide, please. It is very important that when a case is referred, you must ask for some basic information, the age of the individual, the ethnic origin, the reason why testing is being asked for, what is the clinical presentation? If it's an adult female, the pregnancy status, any history of blood transfusion, as well as drug therapy like hydroxyurea and sickle cell disease. Next. So for a precise documentation, when is it needed? First of all, to confirm a suspected diagnosis like thalassemia or sickle cell. To explain a hematological abnormality, it could be anemia, microcytosis, polycythemia. A very important for prevention programs to identify carriers or heterozygotes who are asymptomatic, as well as couples at risk for pre And cell disease is important to identify in the neonatal period. And lastly, of course, all the variant hemoglobins. Next. Next slide. So we need to use a battery of tests while doing the, can you go back? Yeah. So you have to have a good clinical evaluation and history of the patient. You need to do a peripheral smear and look at the RBC indices, the retic count. And then go on to hemoglobin analysis simultaneously, looking at the quantitation of A2F and other variants. Sickling and solubility are needed sometimes, as Dr. Dasgupta also showed. And if you are suspecting an unstable hemoglobin, you will do the instability tests. If you're suspecting an M variant, you might have to do an absorption spectrum. Next slide. So these are basically the four methods. Cellulose acetate is now not used, except if you have to go back to, to look at something, 
when you get some problem in HPLC or capillary electrophoresis. So now it's the high throughput HPLC or capillary electrophoresis, which are used at most centers for a first line. Electric focusing is still used globally at some centers, but it is semi quantitative, but it has been used for large scale screening of particularly sickle cell disorders. Next, please. Next slide. Yeah, this already Dr. Dasgupta showed you this algorithm that we have put up. And the main thing is that uh, the second last column on the right, you have to be very careful of those cases where you have a low MCV and MCH, a normal or slightly low RBC count, and RDWs increase. That, of course, could possibly be the iron deficiencies, which you have to rule out. And then you go one more back backwards. From the hemoglobinopathy point of view, the ones in your carriers, they could be alpha thalassemia, delta thalassemia carriers, or interaction of these genes. So this is where molecular analysis will become important, as also to distinguish delta beta from HPFH, particularly for uh, prenatal programs, because they have overlapping phenotypes. Next. So this is the importance of molecular analysis to identify the atypical carriers diagnosed for invasive and non-invasive prenatal diagnosis, pre-implantation genetic testing, to diagnose in the neonatal period, and then to understand genotype phenotype correlations and identify novel or rare variants. Next, please. So the commonly used methods for molecular diagnosis are either allele spe uh, specific priming like the ARMS method, where you test each mutation individually, or the organization where you test, you can test eight mutations in a single PCRN hybridization step, which covers the six common beta thalassemias along with sickle and hemoglobin E. You could also do an RFLP, that is a restriction enzyme digestion, and uh, particularly for sickle because the uh, sickle mutation abolishes a recognition site for the enzyme DD1. So you can use that. And eventually, you, of course, very often you have to go to Sanger's. Now, next slide. Uh, we see, next slide, please. Yeah. So. One problem in antenatal screening is the borderline or normal A2s, particularly in couples, if they come during pregnancy. And you see here, we had 18 couples where one of the partners had an absolutely normal or a borderline A2. And we know that almost about 40 or 50% of them are due to the CAP site mutation, which is known to be common in India, particularly in North India. But we had several other common severe mutations which led to borderline or normal A2. So we have to be very careful here. You could also have co-inheritance of a delta gene mutation with a beta thalassemia carrier, which would reduce your A2 to normal. So these things have to be very clear. Next slide. Yeah, so this is uh, the spectrum of mutations that we found over a period of about 30 years in uh, about 3,500 couples who came to us for prenatal diagnosis. And almost 90% of them, these mutations, were covered by the six common Indian beta thalassemia mutations. So it was only about 12% where we had to use DNA sequencing to identify the molecular data. And here, these are, uh, there are over 40 variants which have been described in Indians, some novel, some rare. Dr. Daskupta already showed some. And these, again, are some which we diagnosed over the years. The important point to remember is that what comes out as hemoglobin C is not always C. So you must not jump to the conclusion. Here we have hemoglobin Eginogi and British Columbia, both coming in the C window. We have D agree coming in. Next, please. 
Yeah, so uh, over here we have three variants, hemoglobin E trait, D run trait, and Laporte trait, both all of them eluting in the hemoglobin A2 window. Lepore has a characteristic hump in the A2 peak, so you can identify it easily. But what happens is in these cases, if you have an E trait, you cannot estimate A2. And this is where capillary electrophoresis has an advantage because A2 and E can be separated. So quantitation of A2 is possible in the presence of hemoglobin E. Uh, next slide. And I show you just another example of, uh, again, another variant, hemoglobin D, agri, which looks exactly like L. And it's only when you go back to the sickling test that you know, see that it's negative in D agri. And this is a novel variant which we had identified, which had two amino acid substitutions in the same beta chain. Next, we look at, uh, next slide, we look at uh, two, again, uh, variants which have clinical significance. Hemoglobin corn is an unstable hemoglobin, which came out as a peak in the hemoglobin C window. It had This causes severe hemolytic anemia and reticulocytosis because the substitution is in the internal contact region of the hemoglobin molecule. Next. Now we quickly look at the newborn screening for sickle cell disease. This is particularly relevant for sickle cell disease because early diagnosis will reduce the complications and comprehensive care will reduce morbidity and mortality. So various technologies have been developed and used. In India, it's mainly the HPLC2 machines used, either the NBS machine, which takes dried blood spots, or the variant 2 machine shown below, which takes liquid sample. You have to confirm again by molecular analysis. And this just shows you the separations of the liquid cord blood samples on the variant two in the newborn period. You can very easily diagnose the three genotypes. On the dried blood spots on the variant uh, NBS analyzer, the peaks that you see are a bit smaller of A and S, but you can very clearly still distinguish them. And lastly, we have the Uh, Dr. Kola is facing some internet issues. Uh, she's just joining back. Uh, so we'll be continuing with the presentation shortly. She's just joined. Dr. Kola? Yeah. Yeah, you've dropped off in between. I'm sorry. So can we continue? Okay, this is my last slide where I showed the point of care testing, hemotype SC, based on lateral flow with monoclonal antibodies. And you don't instruments, electricity, refrigeration. And this test has a good sensitivity specificity, can be used at the bedside, both in adults as well as newborns. Can identify S and C, all the genotypes. C we don't have in the country, but it's very useful for the sickle genotypes. 
Thank you. I'll stop here and we can take up questions later. Thank you, Dr. Kona, for a very lucid and illuminating presentation. Uh, our next speaker is someone who needs no introduction. He's a titan of the hematology world in India and globally as well. Uh, this is our next speaker, as everybody knows, is Dr. M.B. Agarwal. So, as I mentioned, he needs no introduction to anyone. He's a hematologist and hematologist par excellence. He's a professor and head of the Department of Hematology at Bombay Hospital Institute of Medical Sciences. He's also associated with the Leelavati Hospital, Mumbai, and Breach Candy Hospital, Mumbai. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amar Das Gupta and Suburban Diagnostics for having me. I've been asked to speak on drug therapy, ion chelators, hemoglobin F enhancers, and drugs increasing oxygen affinity. So first part of my talk is related to iron. Iron overload is a problem in thalassemia and also to some extent in sickle cell disease. The organs that get loaded include pituitary, heart, liver, pancreas, and gonads. And depending upon the age of the patient, the earlier is the liver and latest is the heart. As far as the chelation is concerned, we have three molecules, deferoxamine, Defriprone and Deferacidox, also popularly known as Desferal, Calfer, and Defrijet, and of course that is available by various names. Talking about Desferal, it's an injection which has to be given subcutaneously using an infusion pump over 8 to 12 hours, and usually that is done overnight. Sometimes when the patient is severely iron overloaded, comes very late, we put a port like this and give it over 24 hours continuously for a few weeks to few months to rapidly bring down the iron, especially if the heart is affected. As far as the oral chelators are concerned, you've got two of them, deferiprone calfer, which has to be taken three times a day, and deferacidox, which is to be taken once a day. Previously, we had deferacidox, which had to be dissolved and uh, drank, but now we have film-coated tablets, which can be swallowed. Abroad, there is also what is called sprinkle, which can be sprinkled on any kind of preparation. In general, deferacidox ticks all the boxes. It is once a day, whole body iron chelator without much toxicity, very efficacious and not many side effects. Iron chelators can be used in combination like DFO with DFP, DFO with DFX or DFP with DFX. So all these combinations are possible. There's one new chelator, Altrambo Pack. It's a powerful ion chelator, but not yet licensed for this purpose and probably will never be licensed for this purpose. Not all the organs can be chelated or uh, made free of iron at the same speed. When you give chelators, liver loses iron very fast, but heart loses it very slowly. So this there was a 60 year story of iron chelation, which began with intramuscular desperal and has come up to Deferacidox, and the newer ones are on the horizon. Second part of my talk is about the newer therapies in thalassemia. And these relate to understanding the pathophysiology of thalassemia, and then having these molecules based on this pathophysiology, and they can be classified into three categories. One, that correct the globin chain imbalance. Two, that correct the ineffective erythropoiesin. Three, that improve the iron overload. You see the four parts of this slide, A, B, C, and D. A are those which correct the balance of the chain. And the one that we are going to discuss today is the hemoglobin F induction. The second one are those which correct the ineffective erythropoiesis. And the one I'm going to touch upon is loose metal cell. So let's talk about hemoglobin F induces. And the commonest is hydroxyurea. It's one of the earliest of the drug which showed promise, especially in thalassemia intermedia. But its efficacy in thalassemia major is ill understood. It's quite clear that this is a powerful agent in reducing the transfusion requirement in thalassemia intermedia and some of the thalassemia major. Hydroxyurea is an S phase specific drug. It induces the expression of gamma globin through various molecular pathways, it exerts many favorable effects on hemoglobin, RBC indices, 
in effect to erythropoiesis and blood rheology. There are certain genomic variants which can be considered as biomarker to assess its therapeutic efficacy. Use of hydroxyurea in sickle cell disease is standard, but it is also strongly recommended in NTDT, that is thalassemia intermedia. And this is Cochrane Library talking about hydroxyurea to reduce blood requirement in NTDT. The second molecule that I want to touch upon is thalidomide, which is a promising agent and has been now used quite widely in India. And this is how within a few weeks to months, it improves the hemoglobin and makes the patient transfusion free. So it's quite efficacious in thalassemia intermedia, a study from China. And you can see hemoglobin going up from 5 to 7 to almost about 9 to 12. Once again, you can use hydroxyurea and thalidomide in combination. And that's an Indian study, safety and efficacy of linking the two in both intermedia and major. And these are the results, hemoglobin going up in both intermedia and major. That's an Italian study showing an optimal response of thalidomide in thalassemia major. And when patient has a low antibody and transfusions are difficult, low dose thalidomide can come to your rescue. And this is thal thalidomide to decrease or rather to increase the platelet count in a person who has thrombocytopenia due to hypersplenism. Not only thalidomide, the second and the third generation molecules of IMIDs like lenalidomide and pomalidomide in experimental studies have been shown to augment this particular activity. And this is high level induction of fetal hemoglobin or pomalidomide in the erythroid progenitor cells. As far as the C and D are concerned, they are not going to the part of my talk today, but I am going to touch upon loose petal set because the molecule is going to be available to us through BMS next month. That's something new, and that's loose petal set. This is the molecular structure of loose petal set. Are we going to be available as Reblozil, an injection in 25 milligram and 75 milligram vials? It's a transforming growth factor beta ligand trapping molecule. It targets the later stages of erythropoiesis. It has a remarkable and durable effect for anemia of thalassemia, not only intermediate, but also of major, and has the capability of making it transfusion free. It's once in three weeks injection given in the dose of one milligram per kg to start with, and you can go up to 1.75 milligram per kg. Erythropoietin and darbepoietin act at the earlier part of erythroid maturation and loose petal sept in the later part. And that's how hemoglobin keeps rising with loose petal sept. And that's how the transfusion frequency keeps coming down with loose petal sept. And ankle ulcers can heal with the improvement in oxygen supply to that area. The last molecule I will touch upon is ruxolitinib, which is a JAK2 inhibitor, which can produce what is called medical splenectomy in patients who have got large spleen and do not want to undergo surgery. Now coming to the last part of my talk, and that is related to sickle cell disease. And there are three molecules which have been approved in the last two, three years. Crizanlizumab, marketed in India as Rivarna by Novartis, Voxelotol, and L-glutamine. I'll stick to Crizanlizumab in the interest of time, and as that's the only molecule available to you and me here. So that's Crizanlizumab, Rivarna, which is a monoclonal antibody against P-selectin. P-selectin is a sticky factor. So what it does is it sticks the white cells to the capillary endothelium and brings about sickling crisis. So Prizalizumab is a monoclonal antibody against P-selectin. It blocks this kind of interaction or sticking of white cell with the capillary endothelium and avoids the sickling crisis from taking place. Two doses are given in the first month and then it is given every month. It's a short IV infusion. So it is an alternative to hydroxyurea or it can be added to hydroxyurea. It's useful for patients who experience two or more vasoclusive crisis every year. The dose is 5 mg per kg. It's available as 100 mg per 10 ml vial, infused over 30 minutes, 14 doses in the first year. The pre-medication is as usual for any other monoclonal antibody, but steroids should not be used. This is the vial of Rivarna as we get it. 
The results are fascinating and uh, published from the US group of people. Ataga is the worker. Rizal is a for prevention of pain crisis, sickle cell disease, New England Journal. And what it concludes is that in patients of sickle cell disease, Rizal is a therapy resulted in significantly lower rate of sickle cell mediated pain crisis than placebo and was associated with low incidence of adverse events. It's a game changer. This is a British Journal of Hematology article, Sickle Cell Disease Progress Towards Combination Drug Therapy, talking about crizanlizumab plus hydroxyurea together. Well, thank you so much for giving this opportunity to me to speak to you. Uh, thank you for such a dynamic presentation, Dr. Agarwal. Uh, as Dr. Agarwal has pressing commitments, he will not be able to join us for the final Q&A session. Therefore, we'll have a short session with him now before he has to leave. Uh, Dr. Agarwal, we have a couple of questions from the uh, the chat, you know, the audience. So one question that's come up is, as a treating physician, what handicaps do you still face in managing your patients? And is there anything that laboratories can help uh, to, you know? Yes, of course. I mean, for example, thalassemia, we require ferritin assay at irregular intervals. We also require monitoring like uh, RBC antibody for LO antibody detection in people who get sensitized. Organ function profile, virology, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV. Organ functions including calcium metabolism, vitamin D. In sickle cell disease, there are various parameters once again including cardiac like anti-pro BNP, and uh, drop assays. So lab is of great value in treatment of thal as well as sickle cell disease. So, and uh, so in your experience, what has been the actual real world impact of these newer treatments that you've, that has come? How is it different from say 15, 20 years ago? Oh, yeah, it's, it's quite impactful. For example, the newer oral ion chelator deferacy rocks available as FCT, the tablet has made life very, very convenient for uh, patients who require chelation, especially thalassemia major and intermediate. Prizalizumab is a breakthrough. It has significantly reduced the vasoocclusive crisis. Thalidomide in combination with hydroxyurea has made over 80% of thalassemia intermediate transfusion free. So yes, it's, these are all game changers. Uh, so we have another question on the box is what is the dose of oral hydroxyurea for sickle cell disease? 20 milligram per kg is the dose. As per tolerance, you can decrease or increase. Okay, sir. So one last question we have is that, uh, you know, hemoglobinopathy uh, for a person suffering from hemoglobinopathy rather than just the physical active effect, there are a lot of social and psychological support that's required. So do you know of any, uh, you know, kind of support that's available to patients and families in India? Uh, do patient groups actually make a difference? Is there something that we can do? There are very active patient groups. There are almost about two dozens of them. We have national thalassemia parent and patient body. We have Mumbai body. There are bodies in almost all the major states. This is a very, very active field and help is available in the form of professional counselors, both with the Mumbai Thalassemia group and the Indian group. It can be done through chatting, uh, various social media, emails. Uh, it can also be done one to one in person. It's all available. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal, for your time, for your participation and for sharing your knowledge with us today. Uh, it was a great experience having you here, and I'm sure our audience and the rest of the speakers truly appreciated the knowledge you've shared today. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So our uh, next speaker is the ever cheerful and ever knowledgeable Dr. Santanu Sen. He's a senior consultant in uh, pediatric hemato-oncology and uh, bone marrow transplantation at Kokila Ben Dhirubhai Ambani Hospital. His special interests lie in hemoglobinopathies, leukemias, lymphomas, and in the innovative use of haploidentical stem cell transplants. Take it away, Dr. Sen. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Amar Dasgupta as I, uh, when I, before I start my presentation. Thank you so much, sir, for inviting me in this amazing August gathering of titans of hemoglobinopathy. So I'm feeling very small right now. I've got quite a few slides and I might just go over it, but uh, thank you for giving me an easy topic, so as to say, because what I'm talking about is challenges in the management of pediatric patients with hemoglobinopathies. And uh, it's more of talking about what I have seen that's happening to patients. So this is globally what's happening to our patients who have uh, hemoglobinopathies. The green band is where we find all our patients with thalassemia. And if you look at the yellow band, 
that's where we have our sub saharan uh, sickle cell disease but if you concentrate on india and you can see the majority of indians actually have a lot of thalassemia in the population and we have uh, dr das gupta and dr roshan kola have talked about the various pockets of population where thalassemia is very prevalent similarly we have a lot of sickle cell we have hemoglobin e sickle cell of course is uh, really high prevalence in certain states uh, uh, like chatisgarh parts of bihar part of parts of northern maharashtra and especially among the tribal belts which all means that there is a massive challenge that we have to face which is which we alluded to that we have the uh, not so glorious uh, epitaph of being called the thalassemia capital of the world because somewhere between 10000 to 15000 new patients children are born each and every year with thalassemia the sequence cell data is also there though it's slightly more difficult to elucidate but what we kind of know from various studies that has been done that if we have about 100000 patients with thalassemia the number of patients with sickle cell disease are almost about 150000 now for the majority of these patients life is not good because if you think of it they have a need for a lifelong medical attention practically speaking an entire day for their and for every two weeks for these patients is spent in the hospital while they get a blood transfusion but it's not just the patient it's the parents for parents it's work time lost it's income lost for the patients it's part of their childhood is lost and part of feeling that they are different from the others different from the friends different from the siblings and actually sometimes we can often forget that when thalassemia affects a family it's not just the child the patient it's the parents who have to take time off who would devote a lot of attention to their child who's got thalassemia we tend to forget the siblings and if they kind of feel very left alone they might feel ignored in the face of parents pouring more attention towards a more sicker child we also kind of go into the medical thing but there's a lot of psychological impact that it has on the child and in fact we actually published this in uh, the bmj a few years ago where we looked at what is the psychological impact of having a child with thalassemia and it's not just from the patient but even the families have feelings of depression feelings of inadequacy lots of feelings of guilt that having brought a child with sickle cell or thalassemia into this world and that can be very long lasting and then of course there's a huge issue of financial impact of the disease on their lives but why is this well one of the things is that as of the moment there isn't an universal mandatory government screen screening program and yes as dr agarwal has said there are a lot of ngo screening camps that are out there and it has been my fortune to be part of quite a few of these and they do a stellar job they do a stellar job in actually detecting patients who are carriers carriers of thalassemia carriers of sickle cell disease but i have a problem there which is the problem is that even if uh, these camps go and they do camps in schools in colleges in army battalions and even if you detect a carrier i worry how many of them have the advantage of getting a proper counseling done to explain to them what it means to be detected to be direct, to be detected as a carrier then the problem is that suppose you are 18 years old you're in the first year of college you've just had a camp you've gone with your friends and you've been told that you've got thalassemia minor now do they really report do they remember that report when 10 years later they're 28 and they're falling in love with somebody so the love is blind so even if we tell them that you got thal minor please do not get married to somebody else with thal minor I mean, let's be honest, when that time comes, that's going to be the last question you're going to ask somebody before you pop the question. So that's always a little difficulty. We also have an issue that there isn't a centralized registry of all these patients out there who have thalassemia minor or even sickle cell carrier status. And really, we are lacking in follow up of those patients at a central level. What about pri primary prevention? Because it's all fine to actually pick up these carriers, pick up the patients of Thal minor, but it would be much better if we can stop the disease from happening completely. Now, yes, it's easy, theoretically, because we can screen all pregnant women, and certainly it's recommended, and that's a recommendation that has come from the government as well, and I'll allude to that in a minute, but then it is extremely variable. 
The screening of pregnant women with the HPLC to find out whether they have a carrier status depends from where you are, which part of the country, is it in a major metropolis, is it in a smaller city, and it's variable. And that's because there at present there's no legislature to make screening of pregnant women mandatory. There's another very practical problem because quite often the interpretation of a uh, thal minor status might be left to a very junior medical colleague who's joined the department very recently and certainly he or, or she may not actually know what is the implication. The implication of course being that if the mother to be is uh, detected to be a carrier to be a thal minor, we have to check the father immediately to check whether he's also a carrier because that would mean that if you have two carriers that we want to prevent the next child or the baby to be to be born if she's got he or she's got thal major. Now suppose all of that happens we detect that mother has thal minor and we do get a father we find the father also has thal minor so we know that we at that point in time potentially have a child who may be thalassemia major which means at that point we need to get a prenatal diagnosis done as soon as possible. Now there's a problem that there is a lack of fetal medicine departments nationally and even if there are they're mostly concentrated along the major metropolises. Smaller towns and smaller cities may not have those departments, may not have trained personnel to be able to help them to do this, uh, do these tests. There is also a very real issue which is the error margin of negative tests because that's true for most tests that even with the best of tests we can pick up that the baby is thalassemia free with only about 96, 97 percent certainty. So which means there's a very important three percent of cases who might have been given the reassurance by the medical department that your child does not have thalassemia only to get the shock of their lives about two months after the child is born. Can we do universal newborn screening? Is it available? The, the, uh, the whole process is there, but it's not again universal. Many countries have done it. Certainly, it's fantastic if you can do it for sickle cell. But then I kind of wonder that if you're doing universal ne neonatal screening, is it a little bit too late because I would much rather do something which can prevent it. But has it been done somewhere? And we can look at various countries like Italy, like uh, Turkey, where they have started work on this for a long time. In fact, Italy had started from the 1960s, where they set up networks of expert physicians, they set up national programs expanded the training of the specialist and health uh, providers and with various screening programs and public awareness campaigns they managed to decrease their incidence of thalassemia and sickle cell disease down to 85 percent which means Italy at the moment most of their cases that that they are still detecting is among the migrant population that is coming to their country from Africa and even for that they've got a fantastic way to detect uh, to kind of pick up the pick up these patients which is the minute an immigrant comes to medical attention, it can be to a GP, can be to a physician, can be for even a blood test. The first thing that has to happen that he needs to have a screening test done. So that's how robust a system can be. What about us? I mean, Dr. Roshan Kola is here and she's done groundbreaking work in advising the government how to go about it. And certainly these, uh, 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 all of these measures are there as to what needs to be done. But realistically, it needs a little bit of central push to get, make it happen in a much more robust fashion as soon as possible. But there has been progress. There has been this uh, issue of how we get into the problems of getting blood to patients. And we have been using uh, internet and the power of uh, Working together, e Kosh is another website that has been set up by the government which gives, it gives information to thalassemia patient to let them know where blood would be available. But going to the patient side, what does it mean for a parent? First of all, this bewilderment by actually given the diagnosis and I worry whether they are getting enough counseling about it. Then comes a challenge for him to find a transfusion center that's close to home, close to work. There's issue with blood availability and that's always there. And you can see with this, uh, this is the graph about blood donations, because of course blood, you need a donate, you need a donated unit. We can't manufacture it. We can't go to a pharma. And it depends upon how many units has been donated to be, make sure that's available for our thalassemia patients. This issue with safe blood. I mean, yes, nowadays most units are tested by triple H, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV. 
But um, I do a lot of thal camps, and when I go to the smaller thalassemia centers in the interiors, I was actually quite shocked to see that the majority of thal patients who are more than eight years are all hepatitis C positive. And that was because that we haven't been that aggressive in checking for it in the past. Parents have problems with getting leukoreduction filters, which are essential for thal patients in order to stop febrile uh, reactions from happening. Medications for thalassemia and Dr. Agarwal talked about the various chelators. So it is available free of cost to thalassemia patients uh, by the government centers. But then again, there's an issue of availability. And then there's a question of how to administer. And all of those things need to be taught to parents. And I alluded to the fact that it means for a parent there is a loss of income when they bring their child in. But it's not just the parent, not just the patient, because sometimes it can be a challenge to some of the smaller transfusion centers uh, out in the periphery. And for many of them, thalassemia seems to begin and end with the transfusion because there is a lack of trained personnel in the centers. We keep on talking about our guidelines where the target baseline for thal patients should be maintained at 10 gram percent. And if I'm honest, that's a difficult target because it will depend upon how many units of blood the center of a doctor has, and he's got to divide it among all the patients that has been registered with him. I alluded to the blood availability and the testing issues, and certainly we are trying to prevent infections. And if you could get NAT tested blood, it would be better, but that's a step too far. We need to test for iron overload. And yes, we look at ferritin, but uh, ferritin is a very poor marker to check for how exact iron overload is. It would be much better if you could do a T2 star MRI, but there's a problem again with how, uh, how much uh, availability and how, how accessibility of T2 star MRI for the vast number of our patients. Thalassemia cannot be thought of as a disease in isolation needing blood transfusion. You need a complete, complete total package for it because patients have endocrine problems, cardiac problems, they have growth issues, uh, the iron overload in the pituitary would make them short, we need to get an endocrinologist there, you have problems with fertility and there's a lot of psychological issues, all of which needs to be done. I have to, uh, I have to kind of mention that Dr. Mamta Mangani has set up a fantastic unit in Borivali. She's set up a comprehensive thalassemia care center which fits the bill of what a center should be like. There are specific challenges. There are specific challenges in the chelation, which we talked about. And I said that ferritin is a poor marker. Desferoxamine, when we give it, it has to be given over a long time. Defriprone or Kelfer can lead to a granulocytosis, which means we need to monitor the CBC to make sure the accounts are not getting too low. Deferocerox possibly, as Dr. Agarwal had already mentioned, is the best of the chelators that we have. But then again, there's a problem that before the filling coated tablets came, it had to be dissolved in water and it has to be dissolved in a glass, in, a, in a, like a ceramic or a glass with a plastic spoon because it leads to a metal stainless steel glass. And these are all educational issues we need to talk to parents about. There are issues with aluminization that's kind of very prevalent. In sickle cell disease, aluminization can be seen up to 76% and with thalassemia that can be seen up to 37%. And this needs specific measurement, advanced uh, medications and knowledge to actually uh, deal with it, which may not always be available to many smaller centers out there. So I come to what I do, which is transplants, which is BMT. As you know, it's the only, it's the only modality of cure for a patient. And the first barrier when we talk about transplants is doing an HLA typing in the family between the siblings, parents. And here the problem has always been one of cost because HLA typing costs anywhere between eight to 12,000. For average family of two or three siblings and parents, the cost goes above 50,000 straight away. And this is where various NGOs together with uh, the German uh, registry DKMS have come in to make HLA typing available to parents free of cost and we have done our bits with doing all of these camps over Maharashtra, Gujarat, as you can see in the map. We've done a lot of this tech, uh, HLA typing camps, not just us, that's been done by both transplant centers, which means that for parents, at least they are one step closer. They know whether they have a fully matched sibling within their family. So we managed to really address that little bit of a gap. But then once we have done that, what happens if there is no match? Because 
our experience this is last year after having screened about more than 2000 patients with hla typing we only found about 60 to 70 matches and that's the real world scenario that are fully even in families with siblings you only uh, you'd only be able to get a fully match in about three to five percent now even after finding a match within the family the family is overjoyed but then the grim reality of cost comes in also the, then the thought is that they might be interior of Maharashtra somewhere or somewhere in Gujarat and they have got to travel to a distant center to actually get that transplant they have to get admitted for two months follow up and local stay is mandatory for four months which means six months at least for a transplant will be closed and a follow-up has to be a year so besides the cost of having a transplant it's the cost of staying away from home for the family for the father or mother loss of income where to stay is there a place close to the hospital that family can live all of these things comes into place and if we talk about the cost of transplant this chart kind of tells you how much it is that in india currently the cost of an autologous transplant is about five to eight for a max sibling donor which is what we do mostly for thalassemia is eight to twelve lakhs just compare it for a second with which is what the cost in summer in us and you can understand why we still manage to provide a fantastic service at a price that might sound exorbitant, but it's actually kind of very reasonable. So, but then even if the cost is so high, can something be done? And this is where the Coal India with their Bal Seva Yogana has done a wonderful work by actually putting together their CSR funds through the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and then dive, directing it straight away for BMT transplants for thalassemia patients. And more and more such schemes are needed in order to make transplants accessible to all patients. We do have individual CSRs from hospitals and crowdfunding, uh, uh, crowdfunding agencies coming in to oversee and to kind of like under, underwrite the transplant cost. We also need to think where our patients can go about the NC uh, experience and other services. But even with all of these, 95% of patients will not have a donor within their family. And for them, mud donors is or what we call as a match related donor is the only option. And initially, for a long time, India did not have a stem cell registry. Now, thankfully, Datri is here, which is a fantastic stem cell registry. And DKMS, BMST is another registry that has started their services, which means that now we have finally are able to find donors for our patient. But we have some typical problems which are for India. Number one is donor refusal which means that somebody might sign up to be a donor, but when approached to be a lifesaver, many a time in up to 30 to 50% of the time that uh, individual refuses to be a donor and then it becomes uh, really a sad time for everybody. But if there's no family and there's no mud donors, is there something else we can do? Yes, nowadays we can do a half matched haploidentical transplant for our patients, which means that the donor can be found within the family the father or the mother can act as a donor, and that's certainly one way we can actually offer a transplant to our patients with hemoglobinopathies. So basically, end thoughts to my presentation that BMT as a modality of cure, even today, remains inaccessible to the vast majority of our patients due to these various factors. I mean, leaving aside BMT, even the basic, safe, regular, proper transfusion can remain a huge challenge. Chelation therapy for majority of our patients is suboptimal uh, and comprehensive care is really not there. And we await strong government initiatives to make sure that these preventive measures to stop thalassemic patients from being born comes into place. And that's how we'll get to the stage where we can say that we are at that point what we are aiming for, which is a thalassemia book Bharat. Thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Sen. Uh, our final speaker today is the illustrious Dr. Italia, uh, who's a translational scientist. He's been continuously striving to translate research into impactful medical programs. Since 1978, Dr. Italia has been working on sickle cell anemia amongst the tribal people of Gujarat. As honorary director, he's played a key role in incorporating India's first comprehensive sickle cell anemia control program in the government health services of Gujarat state. 
In 2011, the Guj government of Gujarat's program was awarded Prime Minister's Award by Honorable Dr. Manmohan Singh as a model project for the All India level. He is associated with many ICMR and Indo-US US research projects, and he is also a founder, trustee, and secretary of Valsad Raktadan Kendra, an NGO working in the field of blood banking and hematological research. Over to you, Dr. Italia. Good afternoon, everybody. Greetings from Walsa Raktadan Kendra, the birthplace of sickle cell anemia control program. Do you listen to me? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are, you're audible. You're audible. Okay. So my point, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very much thankful to Dr. Das Gupta for inviting me at, on this platform. Uh, I would like to talk about the GEO NGO partnership program in what we have done in Gujarat. Um, uh, I'll be concentrating more on Gujarat pattern and Gujarat model. Our aim is to bring in science to the doorstep of tribal community. This is the very basic things which we are doing over here since many, many years. We are transforming projects into programmatic mode. Initially, the, there are, there are short-term projects which are financed by one or other organization or other uh, government. But now, this sickle cell program uh, is converted into a programmatic mode and it is going to last forever and it is a part of the NHM at the moment. So from 1978, the first patient I found in 1978 till 2021, it has, uh, um, it has gone far away uh, 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 and uh, we are very happy for that. This is my first patient who was diagnosed in 1978 for sickle cell disease. And he lived a very long life and died recently in December 2020. He was the first patient and lived for 42 years after the diagnosis of sickle cell disease. And as a result of counseling, follow-up and treatment from our side, he has lived a better life. Uh, the next person, uh, he himself was a sickle cell, uh, he himself was a doctor. And he, he and he lived for um, forty three years after the diagnosis, and he died at the age of eighty one in last April two thousand twenty one due to corona. Uh, he used to uh, uh, take treatment uh, very uh, regularly. He was a disciple of yoga, and he was a very good counsel for other sickle cell disease patients also. So since 1978 to 1984, my observations were that, that the most of the patients are economically poor and tribal. Many of them are illiterate, mostly residing in remote tribal areas. In short, they will never visit a pathological laboratory for their blood test by spending their own money. Hence, dedicated NGO Walsa Raktadan Kendra was established in 1984. And most important part is that, that unless and until they are tested for sickle cell, they are misdiagnosed and mistreated as the clinicians were not aware of existence of sickle cell gene amongst their patients. I'm talking about 1978 to 1984 period. During 1984 to 1987, random surveys in higher secondary schools, colleges were done considering that these students are learned and will spread the knowledge in society and they are also of marriageable age group in near future. Lectures on awareness amongst different societies, schools, colleges and most important amongst medical doctors were carried out. In 1987, first time financial grant from government of Gujarat was received for community screening. It was rupees 35,000 only. In 1987, a systemic survey of unrelated tribal families was carried out in Chithli Taluka, one of the Taluka place where I was born. Solubility test was used for screening and we found that only 15% incidence of sickle gen was there with 13.5% sickle trait and 1.5% sickle disease. This population was unrelated tribal population. Similarly, one ICMR survey was carried out in nearby village 
with 100% population and out of that 95% of our 95% population was of dotia patel community and we found that 32% incidence of sickle gene so the results were conveyed to the director of health services and he ordered immediately to all government agencies not to provide any financial grants for sickle cell projects as this is a hereditary disorder and nothing can be done for that so during 1987 to 1997 there were no grants from government hence no major surveys nor any specific treatments by government institutions so during this time many ngos and individuals were putting their efforts on a sickle on a small scale for sickle cell and once again in 1997 small scale grants were released and many ngos has contributed in bringing awareness about sickle cell anemia among the tribal group of people one of the icmr project during 98 to 2003 among primitive tribes has revealed the incidence of sickle gene in kolcha community as 5.3 in kotwaria it is 11.1 in kathodi it is 10.0 and overall it was found to be 7% with 6.5% sickle trait and 0.5% disease this project was very instrumental in creating awareness among politicians and public laminated color coded cards were given to all screen persons white card was given to normal person white and yellow was given to a trait and uh, uh, complete yellow for sickle disease and this card color coded cards were further used for marriage counseling that two yellow card people should avoid marriage on 30 january 2006 the modi government mr narendra modi was our chief minister and this government has taken a decision to appoint valsa raktadan kendra as a nodal agency to improve uh, to implement the sickle cell control program in state health services uh, in gujarat state so in, on 30 july 2006 is a landmark day written in golden words in the medical history of india that gujarat is the first state in india to incorporate sickle cell anemia control program in the state government medical services this was inaugurated by none other than dr graham sarjan who has come, who, who has come for nearly uh, uh, more than 20 times to our place and he has guided us for this program so sickle cell anemia control program is a public private partnership program uh, of the government of gujarat the sickle cell anemia was a neglected tribal health issue since the existence of uh, 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 existence was established in 1952 in india gujarat is the first state in india to incorporate this program thus transforming projects into programmatic mode the comprehensive program fulfills the guidelines on sickle cell anemia recommended by who the program will help in early diagnosis treatment and counseling of sickle cell disease patients including prevention by marriage counseling and prenatal diagnosis training of um, health workers iec um, uh, then uh, ngo involvement free mass screening free diagnostic counseling and treatment facilities marriage counseling everything is being done under this project there are hoardings everywhere in the villages regarding sickle cell patients what to take care and what not to do again in 2007 government of gujarat has approved a grant of rupees 2.5 million 25 crore rupees for mass sickle cell screening of south gujarat people it was awarded to valsa raktadan kendra to continue this program and we found that out of 1 crore 7 lakh tribal population of gujarat 98 lakh 20000 people, people have been screened and 7 lakh 77000 people are turned out to be sickle trait and 29680 that means around 30000 people have been found out to be sickle disease and overall sickle gene incidence in tribal population was 8.2 let me tell you that the sickle disease patients nearly 
who were diagnosed under this program were misdiagnosed and mistreated before they were diagnosed as sickle cell disease. So if you consider the figure of Gujarat state with ma of mass population, we can say that total population of uh, India uh, among tribal group is around 11.51 crores. About 8.6% of our population is tribal. So out of 11.51 crore, 90.92 lakh people are having probability of sickle threat and 3.45 lakh sickle disease patients in our India. This is most probably uh, as per the uh, 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 survey of Gujarat, which has been done such a large survey. And I believe that it has not been uh, such type of survey was never done anywhere in the world. And about 6,000 new patients are being born every year in India. Modi, our Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister, has taken a lot of interest. He's a man behind the success. And uh, even at uh, Gujarat and even at Delhi also, uh, he has tried his best to include sickle cell thalassemia and hemophilia programs into NHM. He is always there in all sickle cell disease camps, sickle cell camps. Uh, and creating a political will is also very important. I am I'm, I'm talking to uh, Honorable Srimati Panabaka Lakshmi, then Union Minister of State of Health and Family Welfare, explaining about sickle cell and its all consequences. So as uh, I, I was told in our introduction, my introduction, in 2011, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh has awarded Prime Minister's award to the Commissionerate of Health Gujarat State for implementing such a such a new program, which is going to benefit large number of tribal population uh, who was never taken care of. So this is a photograph. Uh, I was there as a program officer. Uh, in 2011, Gujarat State has established a sickle cell anemia control society uh, under Society Act. And all the activities now are carried out under this Society Act. Most important that now every district has nodal officer of sickle cell anemia and every block, Taluka, has one sickle cell counselor. This counselor is supposed to be in touch with all sickle cell disease patients at least once in a month. There is a good rapport between patients and counselors which has been observed during comprehensive sickle cell camps. Counselors are of great help in routine hospital visits as well as in crisis. They also help in getting blood also. So routine medicines, uh, hydroxyurea, pneumococcal vaccines, all are given free of charge by the Gujarat government. And routine investigations are also carried out at all CSCs and general hospitals in Gujarat. The most important part is uh, regarding every, every district has got one group under the EMO, Epidemic Medical Officer, uh, uh, of all the counselors regarding any of uh, 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 anything you need for a sickle disease patient, you just put a word in there and uh, uh, the help will be available at any time. Prenatal diagnosis is offered free of cost in Gujarat state to all high risk couples for sickle cell as well as for thalassemia. All the high risk couples were counseled for PND and those who are ready to go for MTP were subjected to PND before 20 weeks of pregnancy. Just leave a message in counselors group on WhatsApp uh, with patients details and they will do the needful. They will contact them. They will also inform that the things are done properly or not. Every pregnancy uh, reported in this group, uh, delivery are also reported in this group regarding sickle disease patients uh, and uh, follow up is done very well. Uh, regarding marriage counseling, uh, we have to play something like this. Uh, that the people understand about the uh, uh, that two yellow card holders should avoid marriage, but it is not true all the time. Uh, as Dr. Santanu Sen has mentioned, if people fall in love, they will not look after that uh, the sickle or thalassemia status, and they will definitely marry. Now, with recent NHM policies, it is a, it is possible for universal screening of hemoglobinopathies among antenatal cases and PND. The state should submit PIP to get funding from National Health Mission. Even today, 
there is a janani suraksha yojana janani sisu surak janani and sisu suraksha yojana under which this prenatal diagnosis can be performed and the government will bear all the expenses for that the highlight of the program is that being a geo ngo public private partnership program other ngos are also being invited to join program with common objectives one of the hina patel foundation from usa is one of the ngo supporting our program in gujarat so uh, awareness among from the uh, uh, newspapers and other things newborn screening also we have done in the us collaborative project was uh, carried out by us in collaboration with nih usa icma and uh, we have also used uh, uh, telemedicine uh, sin concept in this out of 8517 newborn screening we have found 104 um, newborns with sickle cell disease um, it is 1.22% so rupees 500 per month are given to the sickle cell disease patient by government and are remitted directly into their bank account now sickle cell disease is included as one of the disability with hemophilia and thalassemia 108 free ambulance service is also available for sickle cell crisis and there is not at uh, the time is not far away that universal screening of hemoglobinopathy starts in india for all antenatal cases uh for sickle cell disease cbc uh, and for thalassemia uh, cbc and other investigations for thalassemia also all investigations including hormones are being done free of charge by the indian red cross society of gujarat state branch this is very uh, uh, helpful to each and every one in gujarat so the take home message from me is refer your sickle cell disease patients with your advice to any government psc csc hospitals for free treatment ask your patients to keep contact with the sickle cell counselors even thalassemia patients can also keep in touch with them in their area for help in any crisis all routine investigations including serum ferritin and hormones are being done free of cost and sms or whatsapp message to counselor or district nodal officer will arrange for free pnd for sickle cell disease as well as thalassemia major in gujarat so encourage your patients to take advantage of free government services as far as possible our sickle cell disease patients are born with pain live with pain and die with pain they hardly complain thank you very much for paying your attention thank you very much thank you thank you dr talia for that amazing presentation and for sharing your experience in this public health sector when it comes to homoglobinopathies uh, to the entire audience uh, we'll now we'll be collecting the details of the attendees for the certificate if you look to the chat box you'll notice that a link has been posted in the sticky message on the top of your chat box please click this link and enter your details exactly how you want it on the certificate once you've entered them and submitted the form you'll receive a certificate of attendance in your email inbox within one week Also, please note that a poll has been made alive. Kindly rate our webinar in terms of content between one to ten, with ten being the highest score. Uh, we are running very short on time, but I'll still be taking a Q and A session from the questions that have been uh, put forward on the groups. So, uh, the first question I want to point is to Dr. Roshan Kola. There's a question as to what are the indications for the use of gene sequencing in the cases in evaluating hemoglobinopathies. What are the indications of gene sequencing? in evaluating hemoglobinopathies well uh, gene sequencing is first of all required when you cannot identify a mutation particularly important for prenatal diagnosis and it's also very important when you have unknown or new or rare variants where you cannot identify the variant unless you sequence the gene the so gene sequencing is mainly to identify point mutations and small insertions and deletions thank you dr kola to dr amardas gupta uh, what is the upper limit of hbf to differentiate between hbf h trait from acquired uh, elevation of hbf like in pregnancy so what would be the cut off that uh, you would say would be the upper limit um, <clears throat> i'm not sure if there is any cut off because HPFH is a very heterogeneous disease where the level of uh, HBF in a patient can be extremely low in the range of 1 to 2 i mean beyond 2% uh, so uh, 
that itself is not uh, very helpful. Uh, so when you have uh, a high fetal hemoglobin in a otherwise uh, you know uh, normal CBC, uh, one would have to think of uh, uh, this as a. These are the two possibilities. One is that the patient, if, if the person is uh, pregnant or has, as I was showing in my slide, other conditions which can induce fetal hemoglobin synthesis, then of course you can correlate that with the underlying disease. In the absence of that, uh, I'm not sure if uh, you can make a diagnosis. Maybe Dr. Kola can add to that, uh, other than uh, doing a genetic analysis of the patient. Uh, to say confidently that this fetal hemoglobin, and we are talking about mild elevation uh, beyond the normal range, uh, that you you cannot say with confidence that indeed a case is because of HPFH or is it acquired elevation uh, for the, because of the other reasons if you do not have a, an underlying cause. Uh Thank you, Dr. Gamadas Gupta. To Dr. Sen, uh, one question that's been put up is the role of stem cells in the treatment of th thalassemia or sickle cell disease. Uh, what would you rate that as a role currently in India, in the Indian scenario? Dr. Sen, you're muted, I think. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, by stem cells, we, of course, mean a stem cell transplant or hematopoietic stem cells. So basically, uh, that's what we said that for thalassemia, it's very clear. If you have thalassemia major and if you have a fully matched sibling in the family, it's kind of standard line of therapy you should go for as transplant, really. I mean, this, of course, depends upon counseling to the parents, letting them know about the pros and cons, risk associated with it, chances of success, chances of graft rejection, uh, complications like DVHD, etc. And many of these figures will vary from center to center. And as long as there's been a clear consultation with the parents, I would certainly say that if you have a math sibling, that's what we should do. Now with sickle cell disease, the indications for transplant very rightly has changed recently because in the past it always has been that you would only be eligible for a transplant if you have had a major complication like a stroke or actual severe uh, uh, life-threatening illness. My point is if that's what has happened and if you already have a stroke, that's too late for us to do a transplant. So rightly what we now talk about in sickle cell disease that if you have a severe phenotype of the disease, then certainly and if we have a max sibling, then we should go for a transplant for those patients straight away. Thank you, Dr. Sen. Uh, there's a question, I think, Dr. would be best suited for Dr. Italia. Uh, there's a question put up, is what kind of upgradation can we do in our blood banking and transfusion uh, you know, protocols to reduce the frequency of transfusions for patients with thalassemia, like selectively transfusing young cells? Is it possible? Where do we stand as a country? Is that something that can uh, you know, be implemented in India, Dr. Italia? Um. See, if you want to thinking about uh, reducing the uh, transfusion, I think hydroxyurea among the thalassemia intermediate can help a lot. Uh, uh, a hematologist can talk much about that, uh, but it definitely helps. Uh, as far as uh, uh, transfusions are concerned and safe transfusions are concerned, frequent donors who has given blood frequently in the blood bank, uh, their blood should be utilized for these uh, patients. It is more safe, more safe for them. Uh, naturally, fresh blood is given to them so that they last for a long time in, in their body. But uh, 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 all uh, 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 means uh, all investigations, including net testing, if possible, uh, should be carried out uh, for them. Uh, as Dr. Santana mentioned, that a large number of patients with thalassemia are HBSG positive, uh, so we can reduce that kind of uh, uh, transfusion transmitted infections in that. Thank you, Dr. Italia. Though this is a, we have a lot more questions. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have for now. It pains me greatly to say so. But I would like to thank all the attendees for joining us today and for their interesting questions. We'll be emailing you a link to the recording of this webinar within 24 to 48 hours. You'll be able to watch the webinar at your convenience. Please feel free to forward the link to your colleagues who may have missed today's sessions. Let me thank the speakers once again for sharing their knowledge and time with us on this weekend today. Thank you, everyone who attended today. Have a great weekend. Stay safe and have a good evening.
Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.